So today we've got two parts in our webinar and it's the first time we've ever staged an event where we have YF, YMS members, that's our young members, together with main branch members, all together on the same virtual stage in this case. So just to remind you that after each presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. So do put your questions in the chat box and then Kogi and I will attempt to pass it to the speakers to get their, their answers to your questions. And at the end of the evening, then Kogi, will, as our branch chair, will give a little wrap up talk to us. So now to get on to the very first talk, which is uh, the YMS at the University of Glasgow, I'm going to hand over to Kogi. Thank you, Kogi. Right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, you can all hear me still. Right. Good. Right. SIT UOG was launched in 2018 under the watchful eye of Professor David Lee. Now there's a saying, it says you can take a horse to the trough, but you can't make it drink. David provided the trough, and it's the students who did the drinking part of it. And they did it through a very active committee, and the result of that is the affiliates joining the team is increasing, and they have kept them interested with their programs of orientation and events, which I'm sure they'll tell us more about during their presentation. Today, they are stepping out of their comfort zone because they're going to share their strategy of networking between students, that's the comfort zone, but with members, that's outside. And, and I'm sure it'll be a very useful evening. There are two speakers. Bernard Coe, he's an undergraduate at, uh, at the uh, university, and he's the chair of the committee. He's a strong supporter of giving back to the community. Brilliant. And he did that by joining the citizen program representing his school. But as the chair, he has led the committee through a very difficult time, pandemic, pandemic period, and really doing a hands-on job of participating in the events like moderator for women in STEM and coordinating presenters of the future. So that's real hands-on stuff. And the second speaker is Leonard Goh, who's also an undergraduate. And he's partly, uh, currently the events coordinator in the committee. Without him, those events wouldn't happen. He has, he has also, he's also a very hands-on person, and he has hosted SIT's industry talk with Airbus, helping with women in engineering, and preparing candidates for the SOFI 2020 competition. Really brilliant. So I will stop talking and let them tell us what they've got for us tonight. So over to you, Brendan. Thank you, Kogi. Thank you for the opportunity for us to talk and thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, let me first share the screen so we have some slides. Okay, can we get a cake up? Meeting. Okay, so once again, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow IMAC-E members. We are from SIT UFG IMAC-E student chapter, and today we're going to be sharing on how our student chapter has been running during this pandemic situation. 
I'm Brandon Koh, Chair of the Student Chapter, and along with me today is our Head of Events, Leonard Go, who will be covering the event segment of the sharing. This will be the agenda for today's sharing. We will first give a brief introduction to our student chapter, followed by the management and engagement of the student chapter, and the challenges faced during the pandemic. Next will be a brief overview of our events and considerations made to accommodate the pandemic safety measures, and we will end off with a quick Q&A session. Now, let me start off with an introduction of our student chapter. Our SIT U of G IMAE student chapter in Singapore started in 2018 with the support of our school, IMAE SG, and our academic liaison officer, Dr. David Lee. Our team consists of six members along with Dr. David Lee, and we are committed towards IMAE's mission and vision of promoting engineering. Other than me and Leonard, our other members are here today as well. We have uh, Chen Xi, our vice chair, Xu Yu, our secretary, Clement, our treasurer, and uh, Gerald, our head of publicity. The recruitment drive for our current student chapter went very well, and we have approximately about 200 out of 300 students who have actually signed up as IMAE student affiliates. Our recruitment rate has also improved uh, tremendously from previously up to two times. And we feel that this is because we got to know our students more by joining as facilitators during their welcome orientation sessions. Now we can hear. Management engagement. Uh, maybe I can get uh, Kogi to help us to mute the other participants. <laughs> Thanks. So now I'll give a brief overview of how the student chapter management is like. In order to ensure the student chapter operates smoothly and the com uh, committee members are well bonded, we try our best to follow these guidelines during our service term. Firstly, we make sure to have clear and concise roles and responsibilities for each student chapter member. We also make sure that every member is aware of their job, but we allowed flexibility so that all members were able to help each other if needed. Next, we had very specific goals each trimester. So at the start of each school trimester, we always came together to come up with realistic but meaningful goals to hit by the end of the trimester. And we had bi-weekly updates from each member to ensure that our planning is always on schedule and also to keep our members updated on the overview of events and schedules. Each of our committee members has also been in charge of at least one event during the service term. This is to ensure that all members will have a good learning experience and be exposed to leadership and planning roles. Our student chapter also collaborated with uh, many other communities, such as our school's Center for Career Readiness, uh, the Applied Research, Innovation and Enterprise Division, and of course, uh, I'm at ESG. We hope to raise awareness of our student chapter along with improving relations with everybody we know. And lastly, the committee members will always check out each other weekly so that we can make sure that everybody is doing well and uh, we can help each other out during these tough times. Now, let me share how our student chapter actually improve engagement with the student affiliates. Firstly, we strive to have frequent social media posts as well as interaction with the student affiliates through WhatsApp, Instagram, or even Telegram. Next, we have lucky draws to attract the attentions of students, and this has proven to be quite effective uh, based on our event participations, which Lena will go through a bit later. And lastly, our student chapter takes feedback very seriously. We always try to have a post-event survey form for our participants and also the general student affiliate population to get inputs on what we can improve on and what we can add in further to better interact with them and also help improve their affiliate life in school. We have many challenges during the pandem pandemic, but uh, I'll only focus on the three main areas for this sharing. Social challenges, workload challenges, and constant changes challenges. Firstly, for social challenges, uh, we could not have any face-to-face -face interaction between our committee members, and we also could not interact face-to-face -face with our students. So this made it very difficult to have lasting impressions and also difficulty in explaining our ideas or problems. We overcame this by having more online meetings, as many as we necessary. We also strive to have more empathy for each other and make sure to help each other out when we had any difficulties. And also in order to interact more with the students, we approached our friendly school professors, and some of them are here today, who gladly gave us some time before or after their online lessons to talk to the students. Workload was also, was also one of our main concerns during this pandemic period as our school shifted the assessments to more project-based than exam-based, which uh, significantly increased each of our committee members' workload. 
Furthermore, it was very hard to plan events during this period online, and we had to put in more effort and time to ensure events were planned well and we could finish it smoothly. So we adapted to the higher workload by emphasizing on time management. I had also allocated work based on the members availability instead of their roles and strengths. And lastly, the generous support from our professors who gave uh, extensions for assignments and also uh, Dr. Lee who helped us with decisions and planning really uh, greatly helped the team to build a foundation to overcome this challenge. Our last challenge was the constant changes on national safety measures due to the pandemic, which caused our event plans to have be you know, disrupted or even cancelled. So the team always had to plan ahead of time and we try our best to have backup plans and predict problems. We also adapted to changes as fast as possible instead of you know, complaining and wondering why are these changes implemented. And lastly, we did not overthink issues, which helped to avoid unnecessary stress and wasting of time. OK, now we will have our very hardworking head of events, uh, Leonard, to share more on the event organization of our student chapter. All right, thanks, Brandon, and thank you, Mr. Kogi, for the amazing introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Leonard Goh, the events coordinator for the student chapter, and I would like to share with you some of the events we have actually hosted or participated in. So actually, throughout our service term, uh, sorry, slides. Uh, Brendan, can you go to the slides? Uh, throughout our service term, we were actually very fortunate to be able to, uh, to, be able to host up to six events with our first event being the uh, Presenters of the Future, which I'm sure you have heard Mr. Kogi and Dr. Dr. Uh, Idris talking about. And actually Presenters of the Future, or short, uh, or F for short, is a pre-selection phase for Speak Up for Engineering 2020. And in this event, we actually aim to train engineers to be more proficient and confident in their presentation skills. Uh, the theme for this uh, event is actually any engineering related topics, which will be the same as the SOFI 2020 to prepare them in advance. But as a result of the COVID situation, this event was actually done live on Zoom recordings and participants were actually required to submit a uh, maximum of 200 word summary while presenting on their pitch, followed by a Q&A session. Originally, we, our student chapter targeted to recruit up to 10 participants for this event. However, we are actually very fortunate to receive up to 12 participants whereby seven for, uh, from year ones and five for, from year twos. For the next one, we actually, sorry, uh, Brennan, can you go to the next slide? Yep. So over here, we have our esteemed guest, Dr. Ko Yi Yen, a former IMAE a young member representative, uh, bestowing our first place winner, Muhammad Zuhansi, who, who sorry, Muhammad Zu Hasni, who presented on an alternative eco-friendly manufacturing process to produce sustainable carbon fiber frames. For our second place, we actually have Pradik Kumar, who presented on changing the ways on how traffic system works. Following up on Port F, it is the Speak Up for Engineering, or SOFI 2020. And in the, the top two winners of Port F 2020 uh, actually represented SIT in SOFI 2020 itself. However, because the competition was very tough and unfortunately they did not manage to emerge victorious in the national, national level competition. So moving on, we have our third event, the industrial collaboration. So for the next slide, we actually have a collaboration with the representative from Airbus, uh, SIT Center for Career Readiness and SIT U of G, I'm an student chapter itself. This event mainly focused on raising awareness of Airbus goals and their revolutionary efforts to bring forth clean energy into the aerospace industry. We also had a Q&A session between the SIT students and Airbus itself. So for the next event, we have the SIT Community Challenge. And in the SIT Community Challenge, our student chapter actually teamed up with Mr. Long Chimin from the Applied Research, Innovation and Enterprise Division. We were directly involved in the SIT Community Challenge, whereby we took up some projects of interest. A second task we, ha we had were to be mentors for the young makers. However, due to the unexpected COVID-19 restrictions, 
this mental ship was actually cancelled. As for the projects, our, pro our student chapter actually split into two teams, tackling both the JZ care and the rehabilitation device. So for the next uh, uh, event, we, we were approaching the end of our service term and we were very fortunate to be able to help IMAC ESG in promoting women in engineering. And this event actually aims to eliminate the stigma of engineering being a male dominated industry. Uh, about with us, we, uh, we had the esteemed guest speakers from renowned industries and engineering teaching faculties. So next we have our event, our latest event, the t-shirt design competition. This t-shirt event uh, design competition was actually organized for IMAC e student affiliates to showcase their creative creativity and to create an identity for the student affiliates and club. We have actually received many uh, or rather multiple designs, but the first place was actually clinched by our fellow student. And our student chapter has the support from numerous professors. And in this prior presentation, we were I'm very fortunate to have invited the director of NSITE of G, Dr. Cindy Go. So moving on to our challenges. Even though the student chapter uh, has hosted successfully uh, some events, there were also a lot of obstacles involved. The first obstacle was the long approval time. Some of the events actually involve outsourcing to external vendors for training. However, most of our events actually require special training or requirements. Hence, when approaching these external vendors, it might pose as a issue. Uh, for example, when their management has to discuss budgeting and time schedules. And apart from this, the vendors actually do have other clients which impose other time schedules, like maybe there's a possibility that you, they might not be able to fit into our time or event schedule itself. So for the second obstacle, it was the time disputes. Hosting events with large participants and judging panels will actually require a lot of coordination to find a common time frame. Considerations such as uh, sorry, consideration such as the student timetable as well as the judges' schedule have to be aligned. And as such, competitive events you need to have a flexible schedule to accommodate for everyone to ensure fair play. Lastly. We have the unexpected COVID-19 situation. The COVID-19 restrictions greatly affected our events, especially for physical events. One such, one such example was the Pot F, which was supposed to be a physical event to replicate the attention needed to train the participants for SOFI 2020. Furthermore, this affected our event planning as our student chapter could not meet up, meet up physically to discuss the events. This lack of physical gathering really limited the student chapter's ability in connecting with the affiliates together uh, by using uh, promoting events and hosting events itself. But nonetheless, I honestly feel our head of publicity, Zhao, actually did his best in try trying to connect and interact with the student affiliates through social media. And how we actually overcome this challenge was due to the great initiative within our student chapter, as well as the creation of contingency plans to backup for backups. And thankfully, there were other online platforms such as Zoom and Discord to facilitate both the planning and execution phase. And following that, we actually have our Q&A session. Uh, and I'm not sure whether Mr. Kogi would like to facilitate this Q&A session here. Uh, Mr. Wow, Kogi, okay. Yeah, you guys did pretty well. I mean, we faced the same problems as we have been, you have been facing, but you found some good solutions. Um, I can't see any questions on the chat box, but I've got a couple of my own. I'll skip those off. First of all, uh, I'm quite intrigued with what kind of services. Could you give us an example of what kind of services you sought from vendors? Uh some other services was actually, we had actually one event called Design, Define and Develop, which is actually a 3D competition. And we wanted to train our participants with the necessary skills, like for example, 3D printing itself. Because right now, uh, I believe everyone is like very into 3D printing. So, and 3D printing is one of the revolutionary or rather new technology in manufacturing. 
So we wanted to showcase this uh, technology to them and train them for the upcoming competition. Yeah, but then because uh, we actually approached a few vendors and we actually were turned down because of the time schedule, uh, schedule and our budgeting. Yeah. Okay, and what sort of, how far away were you from the, in the budget? How much did you have and how much did they want? Uh, uh, the budget was off by a few hundred, if I remember hundred, correctly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but right. fortunately, we actually found another solution, which was to go to our student. Actually, it was uh, another associate, association of SIT, which is uh, Mr. Long Ching Ming from the Applied Research Development. And he actually agreed to teach. He had this Dover Makerspace, where okay. he actually agreed to teach us for the 3D printing itself. Yeah. Right. Okay, there's a question here. It says, do you think students who graduate would have an interest in mentoring towards chartered engineer? Uh, maybe I'll take this question. I, okay. I definitely think so. Since uh, at the start, when we actually have our orientation for all the new students, really let them know about the benefits of chartership, about what, uh, what more you can get next time when you graduate. And I think as engineers, all of them will be looking at this. Um, they definitely want this la, for their next progression of their career. So yeah, I think uh, especially SIT UFG students will definitely be aiming for this once they graduate. OK. And another one here say, so how do you plan to ensure continuity in your chapter as students graduate and move on? Um, so actually previously our course was a two year course, now it's a three year one. So our current batch, we are going to recruit new members ready. And we plan to stay as like uh, senior advisors to actually advise our members. And from here on, you know, the next chapter will advise and so on and so forth. Instead of uh, the students graduating and you can't have a uh, momentum you know, anymore. So I think the transition will be good from now on. We don't know, <laughs> we're still the first batch to take try out this new scheme. Yes. But I think uh, if I make a comment on that, there is a common factor in amongst all that, and that is uh, Dr. David Lee and uh, Idris Lim. Uh, they they hold it to, kind of hold it together during the transition, and those are important members. They're in the background, but they are important members. Uh, I can't see. I have one more question, and then probably will you. Uh, what intrigued me was that you. Uh, it kind of had an approach of all hands to the pump. If had, whoever could do it should do it. Did you find any problems with people feeling that you were treading on each other's toes? Uh, there were definitely some uh, times where we had a bit of, uh, you know, hey, I, I did this, why are you doing this? Or, um, you know, why, why do you do it this way instead of that way? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the COVID situation really has brought our team together, especially our student chapter together, to really uh, put, each, put, put, your, put yourself in the other person's shoe. So we are more forgiving and everything. And most of the time, the conflicts are uh, resolved quite quickly. Or if not, uh, one person always, you know, just step down and say, oh, OK, it's fine. Yeah, so no, not much conflicts, not much conflicts, not much stepping on other people's toes. Yeah. yeah. But this, I think you've done very well, in my opinion, because in those scenarios, what happens is some people just switch off because if you're doing it, you carry on and do it. I don't want to do it anymore. So to get them back into the fold is quite a skill. And I congratulate you, the committee, for achieving that. So I think we, I can't see, ah, one more. Great initiatives. How can the more experienced members be leveraged to support young members? What, what do you want from us? In other words. I think maybe we'll be more open with our uh, um, events organization. And then maybe you can, from there, we can kind of leverage on your experience. Uh, maybe yeah. someone is really great at 3D printing, we can ask them first or something before we plan our, you know, our yeah, well, That's a plan. good answer. Unless we talk, we can't leverage. Yes. Leonard, okay. Leonard will do it, right. So yeah. I think we, we've had a fairly good crack at this and I'll, uh, now we, we can move on. So it's back to Andy, right, Andy? Okay, Kogi. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you very Brandon. much, both Brandon. Yeah, sorry.
Go on. I'm just going to say the same thing as you, Kogi. Yeah. That was a really very interesting talk and very professionally presented. So well done to both of you. Congratulations. And we now look forward to more events run by the student chapters because now we know how good you are at doing it. <laughs> OK, so we're now on to the second part of our webinar. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to Keng Lim Go. And he is an eminent specialist and enthusiast for reinforced plastics. We may not realize how much these are already used in many of the products, big and small, we see in the world and use in the world. So where are they in use? How were they developed? And what is their future? Keng Lim is a fellow of the IMEC e chartered engineer and chartered physicist, and his research interest lies in fiber reinforced composites with a focus on basic understanding of the physical properties and implications for sustainability. He holds a position of reader in mechanics of composite materials at Newcastle University in Singapore and is a famous author. He's written a book called Discontinuous Fiber Reinforced Composites, Fundamentals of Stress Transfer and Fracture Mechanics, which I've, I'm given to understand, because I'm not an expert in this field, is the Bible of this subject in Singapore. So congratulations on that. So now I'd like to hand over to you, Keng Lim, and we look forward to your presentation. Would you like to share your screen? OK. Um, Thank you very much, Andrew, for a very generous introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be able to uh, attend and make this presentation tonight. Um, and OK, so this is how it goes. Um, this is the title of my talk uh, on the past, present and future of reinforced plastics. Uh, not just ordinary plastic, but reinforced plastic. OK. Um, because this is an IMAC uh, event, so I thought maybe I'd like to say something about my association with IMAC E. Um, you would have heard from Andrew that I have a chartered physicist. So actually, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Physics. So um, I'm a physicist by, uh, by, you know, by my training, uh, going all the way back to 1992. Of course, um, things start to change. I work in engineering and then got interested in engineering. And then I decided to uh, become a biomedical engineer. And in 2001, I got my chartered physicist with the Institute of Physics in UK. Then um, it turns out that I continue working on engineering problems. And then in 2010, 10 years later, I decided to apply to be a chartered engineer uh, with IMAC E. And then uh, I continue working in, in engineering problems in the area of composite, particularly. And then 10 years again, 10 years later, I decided to apply for a fellow in IMAC E. And thanks to Kogi for, for uh, his mentorship, his advice, um, and I could fine tune my application. And uh, so it, it went on very smoothly. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm from Newcastle University in Singapore. In case you don't know where it is, our headquarters is based in Jurong East uh, in the Devonair Institute. And for, the, for much of the work that I do um, in composite uh, research, uh, we, we work with Republic Poly. So that's based in the north. And we also work with our mothership uh, university in the UK, and uh, that's 10,000 kilometers away. Right. Now, here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, to, uh, and, and this is an overview of how I should be leading you through, uh, taking you through the subject on reinforced plastic 
from the motivation to come out with reinforced plastic background and then to trying to uh, present the message of how plast reinforced plastic really work. So some fundamentals. And then I'll go through some um, common application from the past to the present and looking to the future. And then a message on climate and sustainability of reinforced plastic. And finally, take home message for the future. So um, this is this talk is about reinforced plastic, but what exactly is it that I'm wanting to talk about in these reinforced plastic? It's about fiber uh, blended in plastic, and I call it a convergence of fiber and plastic. Why is that so? Because for quite a quite a long time since plastic was since we we're able to engineer plastic and make into many wonderful things from the uh, mid night mid 19th century onwards and then um and we also know that there has been fibers going around in our uh in our day-to-day -day, uh uh products um you know we have natural fibers we also have synthetic fibers but it took quite a while for for this two material to be blended together in fact it's all simply physically blended and then when it's blended we call it fiber reinforced plastic composite material so why bother why bother with reinforcing plastic okay well to show you what's the advantage now uh we know what, what metal is like like aluminum 6061 that's about uh, 300 megapascal in tensile strength so plastic like uh, epoxy um one of our favorite material but favorite only because nowadays we can reinforce it so that's what the the, the term favorite means now epoxy is not fantastic when it comes to mechanical properties so that's how low it gets but once you can blend it with carbon fiber and depending on how much you can blend carbon fiber into epoxy then you can achieve a strength that is almost as good as aluminum. Now, um, obviously, there will be a lot of exciting application, but first, let's just remember one thing. You can blend it and it forms uh, a material that is as good as aluminum, but more important is it's, uh, it's less dense than aluminum, it's less dense than metal. So um, if you look at volume for volume, you're getting a very lightweight and strong material, carbon fiber reinforced plastic, compared to aluminum. And that actually opens up uh, more possibility or more applications that we will soon be talking about in the next few slides. So um, what exactly is reinforced plastic or uh, reinforced by fiber? Um, what I will be taking you through for most of the examples will be carbon fiber reinforced epoxy laminate. So that's how we, uh, we schematically show what the material uh, looks like. We can line up fibers in many different directions, and each one of these sheets has a particular direction. And if we can put these sheets of carbon fiber blended with epoxy sheets together, they form a laminate. And they're very strong, lightweight, also very stiff. So um, how do we know and understand uh, how these things, these material works? Um, let's just look at some fundamentals, um, starting from a very, very crude estimate to, to tell us how these material really works uh, is the graph of uh, elastic modulus of stiffness versus the volume fraction of carbon fibers. So what this means is that if you, depending on the, um, uh, the amount of carbon fiber you put in, the volume fraction versus of carbon fiber reinforced versus epoxy, depending on how much carbon fiber you can put in, then you will also lead to an increase in the stiffness of the overall composite. Okay, so, uh, what's shown here is the red line, which is the upper bound 
uh, prediction of the stiffness and the green line, which is the lower bound prediction. Now, these can be described by very, very simple uh, mathematical models um, that just involve only the stiffness of the fiber, stiffness of the matrix, and the volume fraction of the fiber. So, what this means is that um, if you increase volume fraction, um, the stiffness will lie somewhere in between the upper bound and lower bound. So very, very simple prediction. If you can do that, you can make uh, materials to your desired stiffness. OK, at a finer level of understanding is the stress transfer and fracture mechanism. OK, I'm just going to go through very uh, quickly about what this means is that now, Fiber needs to take out load uh, when the composite is when the composite material is loaded, so that the matrix material, which is the weaker phase, uh, will be spared the responsibility of taking out load, because the fiber phase, uh, these fibers are are, in are are meant to be strong, but they're also very stiff, so they can take out load. But how do they do that? They can only do that if the matrix can transfer the load that which the external load is acting upon on the composite material, transferring it to the fiber. And this transfer of stress, which we call stress transfer, and then finally leading to fracture, uh, depends on the mechanical property of the fiber, uh, fiber surface, bonding, and uh, so these are the three major um, factors. Now, um, Let's just take a look at three mechanisms very briefly to help us understand how reinforced plastic reinforced with fiber works. OK, so we start with the elastic stress transfer mechanism. Now, this, this is the mechanism that occurs at the initial stages of loading the composite material. So if you can load the composite material, so initially the uh, matrix deform and uh, stretches and then then the fiber takes uh, the fiber also uh, receive the load and also deforms. But how does it do that? It's because of the interface. Now I'm representing the interface by spring to tell you how the matrix is bonded to the fiber. So uh, the load is transferred to the fiber uh, through these interfaces through these springs. Of course, if you load if you increase the load on the composite material, eventually the, mat the matrix may turn plastic. The interface may also be disrupted, but still because as long as the fiber can take out the load from the matrix, uh, it's still uh, perfectly, uh, the, mat the material is still, uh, still able to uh, function. Now, obviously, anything higher, uh, eventually when you increase the load, then you will see matrix crack, fiber pull out, uh, fiber fracture. OK, now what, what, what this means is, although it might look like this is a bad thing, uh, all things do break, uh, let's face it. But what it's doing is that for as long as a fiber can take out load effectively, these, uh, these phenomenon uh, will not just occur easily. And so that's why we end up with composite material that is really strong and of course, also stiff. So um, that's how fiber uh, reinforced plastic work. Uh, let's let's have a, a quick run through about plastic uh, from its past. Now, uh, if you go all the way back to uh, 1284, probably the first uh, known plastic, not really plastic, it is made of protein materials from tortoise shell and is being used to make a uh, musical instrument by Horner Company. So that goes all the way back. And then finally, when we finally learn how to engineer plastic, and this came about because of oil and crude, uh, crude oil, and then some of these get spin off to, uh, to make uh, new materials, which we now know is plastic. So we get our famous telephone in the old days from the bakelite uh, material. And then uh, plastic also starts to take off in World War II. It was used to make bombs. And then uh, after the war, things got pleasant. So you get music like uh, these, uh, these um, uh, records here. And then um, people got clever. You can actually use it to uh, make uh, 
uh, use it for uh, making watches because um, plastic can be very flexible and then contain the electronics in these watches. And then even uh, better if we can put it as an implant into the body so that it can help a patient uh, to live uh, a better life. So, um, and then eventually uh, scaling it up to cars. So that's in 1994. Now, um, two message here is that scaling up is key to wider applicability. As you can see, you can scale it up to bigger scale. Um, you, you can actually use it to make uh, for more uh, varied application. And secondly is plastic didn't just come in. It's because it's an alternative material to others. Now, it could be a situation where metal is hard to come by and you cannot find metal easily or it's expensive, subject to fluctuation in prices, or it can also be, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to place too much demand on other materials like wood, so we replace wood with plastic. So this comes with all good intentions. Um, let's talk about fibers. So uh, our idea of fibers and, and what we know best, um, you know, starting from natural fibers that is used to make ropes like this. And because of their strength and flexibility, this gives us confidence and inspiration to try and make fibers, to engineer fibers. And so that's how carbon fiber came about. And it's strong, but it's also very stiff. So it's, Obviously, there must be good application coming out from this. It's very, very strong. Uh, in fact, of course, it's stronger than natural fiber. So um, let's talk about how fibers can, can be uh, turned into products. So in the old days, we get something like this uh, to spin off a fiber, uh, a rope, for instance, or into clothes. Nowadays, uh, we can do it at very, very large industry. Uh, scale um, as shown here in this picture. Now, this is not just making uh, ordinary ropes or what. This is making carbon fiber reinforced epoxy laminate. And, and, and through this process, you can make uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic in sheets form. And then from there on, it can go on to make laminates. So that's how uh, scalability comes about and then in a very powerful way um, we see how it can be used for many other applications. So um, how do we make sheets of carbon fiber reinforced plastic? In the old days you probably have to do this. Um, you know you have a, a sheet of fiber and then you spread the uh, epoxy over it so and hope that you can infuse into the fiber and then you leave it to cure and you get a sheet of fiber and you can have many of these sheets of fiber reinforced with plastic you stick them together you get a laminate now nowadays uh, things are done in a very um, uh, in a very autom autom automated way and then you can get high quality sheets of fiber uh, and we call this pre prep so it's pre uh, impregnated with epoxy laminates. Now, more than that is that with this sort of pro, uh, with this sort of way of making prepreg, we can actually look into how they can be used to make big structures. And if we can automate that process, as shown here in this picture, or uh, we call it the automated fiber layout uh, machine. Uh, it's actually uh, everything automated. It can be used to make the fuselage of an aircraft. So that is fantastic because, you know, from simple plastic fuse uh, blended with fiber, you're actually making big structures that are really useful. So uh, obviously, um, demand goes up because people are. Uh, uh, the, the take up for carbon fiber um, for its various application leads to uh, high demand over the years. Clearly, the application is about light weighting, um, and that will drive fuel efficiency and then lower your cost of running. So we look at planes. If you can make it lighter, it runs on less fuel. So therefore, the airline. Uh, you know, can generate higher profit. And same goes for the ordinary consumer of cars as well. And so we are seeing 
uh, direct in these two directions, the uptake of uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic. OK, but actually we were not, we were never short of materials in uh, going all the way back to the past. Um, we used to have, uh, you know, uh, we used to rely on natural materials like wood. Now, incidentally, wood is also a fiber composite material. It's made of uh, cellulose fiber uh, embedded in an extracellular matrix like this. Of course, you don't really able to be able to pick up the fibers, but you have to, of course, look hard enough and you can see the cellulose fibers. Now, what's it? useful wood in the old days we get uh vehicles like this well we don't call it vehicles we call it a carriage and they are made of wood then when we have cars motorized cars with engines we use metal we build our uh, cars from metal and then eventually uh it turns out that because of the lightweight and strong and stiff property of carbon fiber reinforced plastic materials like this, we can make cars out from uh, reinforced plastic. And in fact, it's not just about cars, we are also looking at buses as well. Now, more important that is, that is driving this is electrification. Now, um, if we really want to be able to run um, um, our, our vehicles with less fuel, uh, it's also, also about thinking about how we can run it on electricity as well. And if we do run it on electricity, we want to be sure that it can power the car and, and then there's enough power to leave it going for quite a while. So lightweighting is so important because the more lightweight it is, the more fuel efficient, the, the you know, less power you need to drive it. Now, that's the future. Obviously, that's an even lightweight uh, application. If you can make a car that flies, it has to be lightweight, and if you want it to be fuel efficient, or maybe running electricity. So that's what we think the future of cars will be in terms of how it will be made of. Now, this is uh, an application that isn't quite lightly uh, for reinforced plastic, but let's start with the past. So in the past, most buildings are made of wood, right? And we know that. And then, then we have concrete, uh, and then we start to use metals here and there, uh, depending on availability of materials. And then finally, we found that uh, more and more uh, application of uh, reinforced plastic comes into buildings. So, uh, but mainly it's actually for insulation and also for some uh, aesthetic reasons because they can be uh, made into certain shapes um, and, and so, uh, so it becomes nice. And sometimes also we don't want to keep depending on wood as well. So we make it look like wood panels uh, from plastic materials. But more important is that in the future, and this is just in case if we uh, for some reason, we have to stay high above ground. Then our living quarters, our residence, our houses might have to be maybe floating in the air. So who knows? Uh, reinforced plastic might just be the thing that will be used to make our house fully, 100%. Um, then we have windmills and uh, and nowadays, uh, you know, going from wood to metal and then to plastic in terms of the uh, wind turbine blades. So um, in the future, um, if we can even make it lighter, uh, if we can make it flying or uh, floating in the air so we can capture the wind at different level, at different altitude, at different direction more easily, uh, that might be just more efficient as well. And Final, uh, and of course, we have ships in the past, you know, sailing on wind, made of wood, and then followed by steel, uh, ship made from steel. And now, increasingly, we are seeing reinforced plastic in ships like this. And in the future, we are talking about containers that will also be made out of reinforced plastic. And maybe we might even go back to how we all started because if we can make ships light, and so they can be moved uh, by, uh, by powers of wind, uh, of course you have to do it quite differently from the past, then it, it, it will just be, wind power will just be sufficient probably even to drive big ships like this uh, shown here. 
Finally, we have aircraft, and um, we, we know it, if you go all the way back to the first aircraft that, uh, that was flown in 1903, uh, the material was very, very uh, lightweight, ma mainly wood. Uh, and then also in World War II, we get aircrafts that are made of wood. And increasingly after that, uh, we turn to aluminum because it's lightweight, sorry, uh, because it's, it's, it's metal and it's strong, but also lighter than most other metals. Then increasingly, until quite recently, we see that our commercial planes are also made of reinforced plastic, like 787. Now, um, there's, a, there's a lot of excitement going around planes like this. If you compare size, for instance, the 747 is probably just as long as 787 here. But um, the only difference is that uh, 787 fuselage is made of reinforced plastic. So um, that just means that it's bigger, uh, so it can be made to that size and still uh, lighter and uh, and compared to 747, which is uh, for very few uh, hungry. But more than that is uh, 787 can be uh, driven by two engines, where 747 is four engines. But of course, there's a lot more going on into all this. The, the, the engines would have been uh, more sophisticated by now, so therefore you need two engines. But certainly, driving all this is reinforced plastic. Um, recently, Apple uh, filed a patent for transparent fiber composite material. They claim that they might use it for wearable computers. How that would look like, I have no idea. But one thing I know for commercial planes is that maybe the cabin can look like that in the future because it's transparent. You might just get a better view of the, the surrounding when you're flying like that. Um, things don't stop. Um, the plane, the fuselage made of reinforced plastic is just a, just one uh, one part of the stages of transforming the plane into uh, reinforced plastic. People are looking at blades of the turb uh, combustion engine because if you can make the blades lighter, you can actually make the blades the blades longer. And of course, you you, you can have uh, more air intake, and therefore you can also drive uh, power up, uh, thrust, and so uh, our, our engines can become more efficient. Now, um, if you don't like combustion engine, you can turn to solar power. And so um, our first solar power plane, uh, shown here, was made from reinforced plastic. And if you if you are not happy with staying on Earth, and we know this increasingly uh, with SpaceX, uh, with uh, Blue Origin, and then with uh, the Virgin Galactic, um, part, many parts of these uh, are made from reinforced plastic. But more important is because we want to uh, low, uh, reduce the payload. So um, reducing the payload is important, and it can be found in the tanks like this. Uh, hyper, this X-33 space vehicle. Now, um, if you can reduce payload, you can bring things up more cheaply, you can make bigger structures, and more important, if these payload are made from lightweight and strong material like reinforced plastic, you can make solar sail, and hopefully they can be used to generate energy. So, um, looking at all this, it looks like we have achieved a lot in reinforced plastic uh, from application perspective, and, and they have gone on to improve our life. Oh, really? Now, um, obviously, this is something we all know, climate and sustainability. We have this big climate message that is coming at us every day on TV. Um, it's not good news, but... Um, and, and the, the, the fact is that um, the driving message is that it's got to do with carbon dioxide emission. And we want to uh, meet the global uh, warming target of 1.5 Paris uh, degree uh, uh, for this uh, Paris global warming target. Now, uh, that means we will have to, uh, one of the keys to doing this is reducing pollution generated by vehicles so that you can reduce carbon dioxide emission. Okay, but is, is pollution from vehicles the only way? 
actually there's also waste going into the land. Now, uh, I'm showing you a picture of the past because uh, it, it does look like in the past, um, people were more frugal, were, more, uh, were less likely to throw away waste. So uh, if we ever dig out any ancient site, we don't really see a lot of trash. But uh, nowadays, look at landfills. So you look at areas like this, they are filled with all sorts of products and mainly plastics. And, and this is all because of what we call the linear economy approach, where we, we, we source for raw material, we build it, we use it, and eventually we throw it away. So if we think back, plastics were intended to reduce demand and pressure on other materials, which was a good thing, but now it's polluting our environment. Hmm. Now, what can we do with regard to reinforced plastic? So we make planes out from plastic, or reinforced plastic materials, which is a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, the, what I haven't told you is that uh, depending on where the impact is, you might get damage like this. Now, damage like this are hard to repair. And so uh, there has to be some way of replacing it. Uh, same goes for windmills as well. They, they, they could be damaged. Now, uh, all this damage uh, can be uh, you know, occur due to like, for instance, bird strikes. And so what you get is that there's a lot of damage windmill blades, uh, and, and then, you know, you find them in uh, landfills like this. So increasingly, that's going to get worse. Now, if we say cars are going to be made from reinforced plastic, think again, our, our, our roads, you know, every day you turn on the radio, uh, traffic, uh, traffic jam on certain highway, traffic accident or on the left lane, please avoid this and that. See all these little knocks here and there will, will damage the car. And, and if they are not serviceable, repairable, we might get something like this. No good. So what, what, what is damage on reinforced plastic? I'm just going to show you even a simple dent like this. Now this is from a two drop. So it creates a dent. It looks okay. You know, it's not big, it's about 1 mm in size. But if you turn to the back, and if you look hard, there's actually a, a very nice long crack line. Now, um, obviously cracks are no good. Uh, we, we need to be sure that we can stop it from growing. Uh, and, and this come about from uh, environmental loading on the material. So if we can stop it in time, it will not eventually lead to fracture. Uh, okay, so that's how the crack line looks like. Now, um, if we had uh, made materials from metal, and here's a den, in the old days or in, in, in the current days that we know, you can actually um, repair it easily by just knocking it back. Now, if we have to repair reinforced plastic, it requires a lot of skills, just like uh, surgical, like, like in the circle theater like this. So very meticulously repairing it. Now, the important thing in repairing plastic material is that we have to remove the fracture, the area, and we have to remove it far away, as far away as possible, because we never know what else could be fractured, even though we can see certain fracture lines. So a lot of good reinforced plastic material is removed as a result of repair. And it's not a very easy process. Okay. Now, what do we really say when, uh, when things are damaged at, uh, in, the, in the reinforced plastic? We see fiber full out, fiber fracture, uh, debonding. Now, all this cannot really be uh, repaired at this level. That is why we have to remove a lot of materials, including the good one, because we don't know what's good and no good. Okay, so there are lots of uh, initial, um, research going on to to try and locate um, damaged uh, plastic, uh, damaged uh, areas in reinforced plastic, like drones to search for defects, or uh, in the in in uh, confined areas, uh, and also scanning uh, more accurately, and more important uh, is uh, precision repair using robotic arms. Okay, so repair is one way of trying to. Uh, make prolong the reinforced plastic material. Okay, that's the strategy so that it can be used for a longer time without necessarily having to throw it away. Why, why, do we, uh, why are we concerned with that? Of course, it's because of waste. 
And if we do have to recycle reinforced plastic, okay, as shown here, um, how do the big question is how do we separate the fibers from the plastic in the composite? Um, and I ask this because in any recycling process, we want to come out and we want at the end of it, we want to achieve raw material that which we can uh, use it uh, with uh, confidence. So, for instance, if it's just plastic alone, we can shred it, turn it into pellets, and most times we know it's plastic. We can melt it, hopefully, and then we can uh, and then we, we we can harden it, and and we know it's plastic. But if we have fiber in it, certainly we will have to. Uh, it's regarded as contaminant, so we have to separate it. And besides, we may also want to recycle and use the plastic in its raw state. Sorry, recycle the fiber and use the fiber in the raw state. So how do we do that? It's a very complicated process, and I don't have enough time to talk more about this, but certainly it is challenging. So, um, and there's also a scheme to try and uh, turn from what we have currently as a linear economy approach into a circular economy approach for recycling of reinforced plastic by closing the loop from end of life, closing it back to uh, back to raw material. So there's a lot of work going on, and uh, um, certainly you can you can look more into this on your own. Um, so finally, is this message: if, if we are looking at recycling, are we really ready for recycling? What just intrigued me was just about a few nights ago, CNA had this climate for change reported on plastic cycling, Singapore 4% only, Hong Kong 12%, Taiwan 40%. So we still have a lot to catch up in terms of recycling plastic. And, and what this means for reinforced plastic as well, uh, we, we still even have got a lot to catch up. And then on, on reducing single plastic waste, um, we are also not doing very well. But the simple message, and this is what I got from the, the program is that, Commercially, if we ever try to recycle plastic or try to reduce on single plastic, it actually hurts the company. Okay, I have just three take home message to end today. Uh, I've said that we have made great strides in technology. So uh, certainly in material science and engineering, uh, from engineering plastic, we can reinforce it with uh, fiber, and then it has contributed to technological advancement and improve our lives. The road to hell is often paved with good intentions. Plastics were intended to reduce demand on other materials, but it looks like now it's polluting our environment. We say we will be moving away from linear to circular economy. Question is, are we really ready? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kang Lim. That was a very interesting talk and where you covered quite a wide range of topics related to your pet subject. Um, I've got a couple of questions come in. Um, you just were touching already on, on recycling. Um, and one question was, does reinforced plastic degrade? You know, some plastics, as we know, degrade into other materials and maybe are not harmful to the landfills and soil and so on and so on. What about the um, reinforced plastic? OK, um, if I understand correctly, um, the question is, does reinforced plastic degrade um, after, uh, when, when, you, when you put it into service? Is that right? Right, right. Uh, yes, it does. Um, that's also another factor. <laughs> um, what I know is that when, you, when it's in the environment, several things can occur. Um, fatigue may be considered as a degradation of the material, so me mechanical fatigue in particular. So everything is subjected to mechanical fatigue, particularly on the plane as well. So eventually it, it, it will, uh, the, the, the use strength will, will drop, you know, and then it, it will just give way. But we have to be careful about how we design this. Obviously, uh, otherwise all the planes will keep drop, dropping off very soon from the sky. Another, another thing that is also of concern is is moisture ingression. Uh, it turns out that uh, yeah, you 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 have to face the rain in the environment. There's no choice. Yeah, uh, you you have a wonderful material that you can use it to build uh, for 
constructing the planes and it flies, but there's rain. So how does rain degrade it? It's water, you know, what can water do to such a strong and stiff material? It turns out that actually water can sit into areas, you know, microscopic areas, and then after it, it caused um, uh, ex uh, moisture expansion. And these little moisture expansion, uh, they can, you know, if there's a lot of it, it might just um, create havoc to the mechanical property of the material. So, so it does degrade in the sense uh, that there are also other um, things to talk about uh, in terms of degradation, but, but certainly these two are key to our problems of using reinforced plastic. So that brings me on to a related question about how we monitor that degradation. Now, I just go back to a very, very long time ago, especially for the students listening. And when I was at university, my professor had been involved with the design of the British V bomber wing, the Vulcan wing. And they were very concerned about fatigue, which you just mentioned. And they had calculated it and they thought they knew how it would fail, but they weren't sure. So what they did was they, they set up a Vulcan wing in a laboratory and flapped it up and down. And they, they did it in such a way that the cycles of fatigue, the fatigue cycles, would be much more rapid than any Vulcan in RAF um, Air Force service. And so once that failed, they would know when to bring the Vulcans out of service, which they duly did. Now, that was with aluminium and aluminium was a well understood material. What about reinforced plastics? What about these aircraft I'm flying across continents on? Are the wings going to fall off halfway? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, but but uh, to, to assure you, uh, 787, um, since it, it came into the scene uh, only a few years ago, uh, it took a long time uh, for it really to be approved by the aviation agency. Why? Because uh, we, we have to... Uh, we have to run through these fatigue tests. Fatigue tests can't be done in one hour or so. It's, it's not genuine. So uh, that, there's, you know, there's a lot of consideration going on. And so like one of these uh, fatigue tests might have to be done over, over days, months, and so forth, having to repeat it and then redesign it if it's no good. And then, of course, even flying it in the air as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it goes. Clearly, um, the, 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 the fatigue testing is now very sophisticated. Uh, I'm, I'm, of, I'm, of course, quite assured that uh, to, to a large extent, we, we, we actually have brought the, 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 the so-called um, safety factor, yeah, um, increasing it much higher than before. Yes, and, and plus our different way of calculating safety factors as well. So taking account into different uh, things, redundancy and here and there that will eventually still make the plane, um, supporting the plane along the way as it flies, for instance. And would I be right in saying that crack growth is a little bit different in a composite material than in a material like steel or like aluminium? Because you've got these fibres that might stop the cracks growing. How, how does that work? Yeah, um, you, you see, um, if, you, if you look at steel, for instance, it, it's malleable, you know, it, you know, which means even if you dent it, it can still take on some shape. Of course, it's weakened, but uh, it's still not totally fractured, so it doesn't look scary. Um, but composite material actually is quite brittle, um, or even if mainly because they are stiff. So um, when they fracture, it's quite dramatic. OK, and they fracture into two and the stress goes down rapidly. Yeah, whereas for steel, you might still be having something holding on, still holding on to it. So it's uh, it's all about the fibers taking out load right up to the point where it can no longer take out load, then it breaks. And then when it breaks, the, the matrix material also cannot take out load because it's not good enough, so it also breaks. So a lot depends on the fiber. But of course, they also say a lot depends on the uh, on the bonding between the fiber and the matrix as well, because that also indirectly contribute to uh, ensuring the uh, high mechanical um, strength and stiffness. So what are the preferred techniques for robust, non-destructive evaluation 
of, of uh, reinforced plastics. How do you test them? Actually, um, there, there are many ways. Uh, preferred, uh, preferred. Uh, uh, ultrasound C scan appears to be the the um, one of the preferred ways, mainly because you can do it very quickly, um, and that's one way. But of course, that also means that you have to you have to put it in contact, um, and and it can tells you results, but. Again, uh, it has limitation. Um, you, you can't have the probe in very difficult uh, corners. OK, then if that's the case, when it's in difficult corners at the joints, um, you might have infrared tomography. OK, fine. Uh, then, of course, um, if, you, if, you, if you perform the infrared tomography um, appropriately, then it might just show up the the damage, the defect areas. OK, so that's two major areas. That and are areas. those robust? I mean, do you have a high confidence factor? Uh, well, um, to, to a large extent, um, yes. Uh, of course, um, you should also be able to try and see it with your eyes. <laughs> right, but if it's deep inside the material, I mean, it's, that's the, that was always the problem with steel and so on, but you could use x-rays and, and there are other techniques, magnetic crack identification yeah. techniques and so on that you could use to to find the cracks but in a composite material it must be much more difficult i guess actually yes indeed and and you realize that by now when i just talk only about ultrasound and infrared because we can stay from one side of the surface we have no way of knowing what's on the other side and for that purpose if you use x-ray you will need to have something on the other side to capture the x-ray mm. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's no good. Of course, we can go back to the old fashioned knocking. If you can find a sound that is different on one spot from the rest, I'm sure that might say something. <laughs> that's something that I learned when I was at university, or at least as an apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Another, question. <laughs> yes. Another question here has come in, uh, interesting one. What tools are available to simulate the bonding of the fiber and the matrix? Uh, for example, if there's a new epoxy, I mean, how do you determine whether it's a, a, a suitable material and the bonding is good? How do you evaluate its capability? If you're talking about simulation, so uh, if I understand correctly, the question then is about computer simulation. Yeah. Well, uh, perhaps computer simulation is one area, but then proving it when you actually try it out in in uh, in the lab. Yeah, I love the I love the experimental part because you know that's like kicking the tire. <laughs> you can't do that with computer simulation. What you what are you trying to kick? You know. <laughs> so what we do in bonding is the is the typical lab shear test, for instance, uh, and also the, uh, the 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 bending test. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, where you actually try and uh, do the delamination approach. So the the lab shear test is one of the ways where you bond two materials together and you try and pull them apart. But that's only good in one direction, uh, as you will know, because uh, you are pulling in. This direction, but what about the outer plane problem? So you will need to do it by bending. Okay, um, simulation, computer simulation. Um, it's tricky. It's um, you, you know um, we we have finite element software nowadays that can do almost a lot of things. Um, in, in fact, uh, it's still quite good to think of them as useful tools. Or uh, ANSYS and Abacus, uh, not trying to sell them, but certainly um, they are useful tools, but they should be used with care uh, because they, um, well, when we talk about bonding, we're just making the as simple as sharing of the notes between two materials. <laughs> well, uh, that's perfect bonding, but nothing is perfect. Okay, then there's also uh, uh, adhesive zone. Um, cracking or uh, simulation. Uh, I don't quite understand those uh, new mathematical models that built into the computer simulation. Um, but 
there's a lot of excitement going around how it's working well for many people, giving them good understanding. Finally, if you're looking down from a macroscopic, where, where finite element is usually considered the macroscopic scale approach, if you look at the microscopic scale approach or even the atomic scale approach, we have molecular mechanics or you know molecular simulation where we look at molecules bonded to another molecules in that sense to try and simulate the bonds. Um, not very excited in all these, <laughs> I must say, but uh, that's what a lot of people are doing. But I, I, I like the practical approach. So I've just got sort of two more questions on the sort of sustainability side, just to sort of finish off, unless Kogi's got any more questions. Um, from an energy point of view, I mean, we know that to produce aluminium takes a lot of energy. And, uh, but aluminium can be recycled fairly easily, as you mentioned in your, in your talk, and steel the same. So it can theoretically be used again and again and again, although it takes further energy to reuse it. What about reinforced plastics? What, how much energy, com by comparison, is used to produce reinforced plastics? Mm. And, and thinking about reusing them again and again, do we need to look at the life cycle, energy cost? Yeah. How does it compare uh, with metals? Yeah. Um, I must admit, I'm, I don't have the figures for these energy costing. Uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's it certainly will look like um, metal is a lot uh, more energy efficient. Um, but the way things are going with planes making them out of reinforced plastic obviously has a very good reason. Otherwise, it would not have um, uh, taken off in that way. Um, you, it, it looks like reinforced plastic actually, uh, when you consider it in total, uh, for the whole total structure, is actually a lot lighter. Um, people are the, in, the the aircraft industry uh, are driven to profit making. So if you can slash off your diesel, <laughs> uh, your your fuel consumption. Um, that's very good and it gets passed down to the passenger. But there's also the, the attraction of planes um, that which they can lease from and they do not have to worry about, um, you know, uh, if the planes are not doing too well, broken or what, you know, that, that's when the lease almost comes to the end, they, they could just release it. So they, they are not, nobody's bound in that sense and they get, the, the bucket just gets thrown they just get kicked further and further until somebody do something to it. So the airlines, maybe they are not too worried about uh, uh, these energy cost effectiveness comes to aluminum and 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 uh, reinforced plastic. But uh, you, you, in fact, um, th there's a lot going into it. You, you can add more luggage, uh, and you clearly see that the passenger have a good experience. The windows are bigger. You can see more of the outside, you know. It, there's lots of good stuff coming out from reinforced plastic in terms of that period of use. But what happened after that? Ooh, that's that's a big question. Puff. I don't have in the fact, answer. Our, our, our <laughs> final question is asking about um, do they turn into microplastics? And I know that's a big concern in many people in many ocean micro. Uh, Marine biologists are very concerned about the amount of microplastic that ends up in, in the sea and the oceans. Do you think, uh, what's, your, what's your view on uh, fiber reinforced plastics? Do they add to that, do you think? Uh, yeah, if, if, we, if we indiscriminately dispose them in particular, because that's, that's the key uh, pollution uh, mechanism to, to get out into the land, into the sea. Um, yeah, there, there is a need to control disposal at the end of life. And um, that, so uh, yeah, it, it, all plastics um, will turn into something and they will get smaller and smaller depending on how, how they were treated in the environment. 
Um, the, the process of uh, going from a plastic material into a microplastic isn't quite clearly understood, mainly because the environment around it is not also clearly understood, although we can simulate in the lab, for instance, but it's not quite the same when we put it out into the sea. So um, yes, it does turn into microplastic if you indiscriminately dispose them, obviously, because you don't know where they end up, they go somewhere, you forget about it, it does something. <laughs> so message to our students is there's a huge opportunity for you to find out ways of recycling reinforced plastics. A huge opportunity for you. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very, very much indeed. That's a really interesting talk you've given us today. And I've picked up a lot of information that I certainly didn't know about and a very interesting discussion afterwards as well. So thank you very much for your time and your expertise. And uh, look forward to perhaps uh, hearing from you again. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Kogi. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Kogi for his final words. Kogi, you're on mute. Thank you. I'll, um, well, I add my thank yous to King Lim and a uh, very difficult topic, but he did walk us through the mechanisms of failure and loading with his springs and balls, which um, was a quite a good illustration. OK, I don't want to prolong this, all I'm saying is that this is an experiment which we have done, and I think, from my perspective, a successful experiment, because Idris has already made some contacts for how to get industrialists to come and uh, to talk to their students. So that's a good start. And, and we want to promote this. But for us to promote, the committee on its own can't do it. We need input. And the minimum input we need is people to come and observe us because through observation, you see things differently. And you tell us what, what, what you observe differently because you're coming with an open mind. And the observers, we would request one visit in one year requiring about two hours a year. So two hours is all we are looking for. This, the, if you want to go a step above that, then you could become a moderator. Ideally, I shouldn't have been moderating today because I can then watch all the other activities which are going around and, and improve on it. And a moderator would do what Andy and I have done for today. So you are here for a couple of, couple of hours. We have done it in less than two hours, and uh, there is a rehearsal which takes about half an hour. So I would say about five to six hours. And guaranteed, both parties learn. Absolutely guaranteed. So don't be shy. We've got some exciting new uh, programs coming, but we'll need help. And then if you know anybody who wants to speak like uh, Ken did, that'll be really icing on the cake. So that's my plea. My numbers and my email address is, is uh, uh, on the chat box. Just say yes <laughs> and your name. And with that, I would like to... Uh, Andy, if we finish here or you got some more to say? No, that's everything from my side. Okay, well, I would then, in that case, thank you all the members who have taken the time out to join us, because that's what this is all about, our members. And we would like them to feel that today they got a, got a feeling of belonging to the club a little bit more than they had before they joined us. And I would, with that, I'll bid good night to everyone and happy days to come. Free of COVID, I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much, was... everyone. Thank good you. night from me, and it's good night from Cody. Yeah, good night. Thanks very much. Night. Bye, Bye, John. Bye. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Mm.
Oh, she's got a question, Idris. Yes, go on then. Oh, you're muted. He can't hear you. Yeah, I was just waving goodbye. I'm actually typing a response to John. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> right, wave, okay, you can wave goodbye as well. Yeah. But thanks, Very thank fun. you very much, Kogi. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think, of course, um, I, I really enjoyed the, the sharing very much. I think both by our young members and also um, by, by King Lim. Yeah, learn a lot today. Okay, that's good. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Right. Good night. Thanks.